we were uh, at this particular slide and we did talk about that gasification opens the way for a number of different products other than just power generation. Uh, Okay, so the this, so some of the important aspects is that um, you can get the carbon dioxide in a concentrated form in a pressurized form if you run the gasifier um, at pressure higher pressure and being available in um, concentrated and pressurized form makes the CO2 more amenable to capture. SOX is not present, uh, sulfur is in the form of predominantly hydrogen sulfide to some extent carbonyl sulfide COS and therefore this can be captured as a sulfur byproduct. So you can technically you can get elemental sulfur through the gasification route. NOX is um, much lower compared to combustion mainly because here you have substoichiometric oxygen. Then um, particulate emission is also within permissible limits and there are a lot of reasons for it uh, because um, one of the reasons is that uh, it is no longer at a very high uh, particulate density form that one needs to operate the gasifier compared to compared to the, um, the combustion in particular. And I will actually talk about that when we go into the different types of gasifiers. Heavy organics are within acceptable limits. Coal ash can be mostly glassy depending on the type of gasifier you use. Trace elements can be confined, can be controlled uh, into more into the slag phase and therefore uh, can become non leachable if you use a particular type of gasifier. Mercury if it is present uh, in the coal, some coals do have lots of mercury, then mercury can be um, captured in a carbon activated carbon bed in the mercury bed. The technology is there very well established. When you talk about mercury, um, the elemental mercury is actually a problem. Mercury, the oxide forms of mercury is not a problem. So elemental mercury can be captured much better using the activated carbon. And the gasifier temperatures usually destroy the furan and dioxins uh, compared to the other low temperature processes even if they are formed in the farm uh, in the uh, first place. And potentially less water usage than supercritical coal fired uh, power plants. They are predominantly formed in the combustion environment which you are not allowing. A temperature say can be high as well and train flow gasifiers do operate at this around the same temperatures as in PF ones, but is the um, absence of the oxygen that is prevents the lowers the uh, concentration of the dioxins. Overall, one of the largest source of uh, cooling uh, or the water in uh, coal fired power stations is in the condenser and then that cooling water has to be has to pass through cooling tower where you will easily have 3 to 5 percent drift loss um, uh, over to the atmosphere that is minimized in here you know, the gas cooling uh, if you use water usually it stays within the water circuit and you are not necessarily looking at a very large 
um, volume of water either because here you are cooling a gas not consisting of nitrogen so it is a more constant a lower volume. So the water cooling requirement cooling water requirement will be lot less whereas um, in uh, coal fired power station where the, you will have to supply a lot of cooling water to the condensers because it is all the LP steam have to be low pressure turbine steam exhaust steam have to be um, condensed essentially. So people have done a lot of life cycle analysis thorough calculations etc and found that uh, water consumption is lot less. So let us now um, talk about the status the capacity and all sorts of things. This one was as of 2011 so uh, this is a very uh, definitive uh, information that a good master at that time there is only about 72,000 megawatt thermal syngas capacity uh, 144 operating plants and 412 operating gasifier at that time there were about 11 plants 16 gasifiers and there was other planned 37 and 76 gasifiers those were taken from the gasification database that everyone could um, access uh, freely from the National Energy Technology Laboratory NETL uh, in particular and of course some other sources as well the plants in particular. So in 2011 the total coal fired capacity was about 1800 something electrical megawatt electrical. So multiply that by uh, uh, 1800 gigawatt so 1800,000 megawatt electrical multiply that by 3 that much uh, 5400,000 um, uh, megawatt thermal out of that only 72,000 so it is a very small capacity uh, the gasifier as the gasification capacity in gas capacity as an overall as a percentage of the overall coal fired plant capacity let me put it that way. Yeah, that, yeah. So, so at that time, there was a lot of projection beyond this period. But subsequently, with the focus shifting away from coal, for all sorts of reasons, some of the focus has also shifted away from gasification, coal gasification. Sorry. No, it is uh, total syngas capacity for power and chemicals. So, so there are very few IGCC plants. IGCC means integrated gasification combined cycle plants, which are solely for power generation. Um, but there are a whole lot of other gasifiers which are not accounted for. No one keeps, particularly in China, which are used for chemicals production chemicals production. So even that that is that is still the uh, uh, old figure. So the red one was under construction at that time so up to that that uh, level it was all very well defined. Uh, for the planning plan figures they come and go people plan all sorts of things companies plan all sorts of things and eventually after the feasibility uh, survey or uh, after uh, many other re or for many other reasons many other reasons um, so um, so the plants uh, can can actually uh, the pla plant capacity can go up and down. Some of the plants plants remain as planned, but they never see the time of uh, light of construction at all for all sorts of reasons, particularly economics and policy from the governments. But the major the one important fact here is that. Uh, 
coal still uh, was the major feedstock amongst everything. Yeah, so now, now in most uh, uh, from China. Yeah, so will I think I have a graph there by primary feedstock. Yeah, so in the next ones perhaps. So the next uh, box that I have just brought in, uh, it sh it um, s classifies the capacity in terms of um, chemicals, liquid fuels, power, and gaseous and gas gaseous fuels generation. Just to get the gas, and then what happens with the gas is another thing. Not so the they sometimes the proponents actually sell the gas across the boundary for others to. Uh, do something with it. They don't use it anymore by themselves. Um, so, um, so as you can see, the power generation, if you combine these two, existing and planned, it's only a, still a small. So that actually sends a very uh, clear message that compared to the competing technologies for power generation, Supercritical, ultra supercritical, advanced supercritical, etc. Um, RGCC still is not favored, and there are reasons for it. I'll talk about it. Yeah, there's economics. But also chemicals. So, unless there is a driver for it, Unless there is a strong driver for production of chemicals which can be sold at a high price or production of high value chemicals, the gasification plants are unlikely to fly. Um, so for power generation, for example, in many countries the sell, selling price is fixed. So if the production price generation cost is high, then RGC plants will not become mainstream. Um, in certain countries, the power, sorry, the power selling price is fixed. Uh, they fluctuate. So for example, um, uh, in, in Australia, we pay about $140 per megawatt hour. Uh, um, megawatt hour, yeah. So, but the distributors, they say buy it at any any anywhere between thirty five to up to the five thousand dollars mark, depending on the supply and demand. So during the summertime, when the demand goes up, the generating companies they make a lot of money. They can change it. So it's a different pricing structure there, different policy. The governments do not own anything, so anyone can um, play uh, demand any price depending on the supply and demand. As simple as that. But in certain countries, the price is fixed by the government that you cannot exceed it. So that's where if the generating companies are not making any profits, they will not uh, go for power generation uh, capacity using a technology which they consider um, unreliable, as simple as that. So that's an, so economics is related to reliability. If the plant, if the plant is very reliable, it, if it works at the availability that you want, 90 percent availability over the uh, over the year, then obviously it will be reliable, so that you will be generating power, which will be sold somehow or the other. But if there is frequent outages, this problem, that problem, then obviously the plant will not be reliable. That will affect the economics. Considerably. So, if you if you look at any cost of generation calculation for electricity, uh, you will see there is a fixed price, and then there is an um, uh, operating cost, and the operating revenue is also built uh, built in. It comes in. Operating de revenue depends on how much time you are able to operate it and generate electricity that is saleable. If that drops particularly at low loads for whatever reason, then the economics simply doesn't become uh, favorable to the proponents. 
but the um, fixed cost is also still quite high for the gasification plants and I will come to that in one of the slides. But for gasification plants, it's a different scenario because it's a, it's a cycle which has not completely been demonstrated in a widespread manner. There are only few IGCC plants around the world from which you can get the operating experience, not very many. Um, so it's a chicken and egg problem which comes fast. If more are built for good reasons, initially with public support, I mean government support, then obviously the price will come down, but that's how it is. So all these figures that are there in here, this if you then compare that with the current coal-fired power generation capacity, which is 2,000-15,000 megawatt electrical, and roughly three times is the megawatt thermal, then you can see where gasification currently is. Okay. So that's a bit of a uh, reality check. Now, major there are a lot of a uh, lot of, actually I thought I had this slide in here, but a lot of the recent uh, gasification plants, uh, in fact most of the gasification, recent gasification plants in the last 10 years are actually built in China, um, whether coal or other feedstocks, um, because a lot of the plants are government owned in, in a sense through the different uh, uh, companies. So uh, the risk profile there for the companies is different from the risk profile of the companies in the other countries, other jurisdictions. So let's slowly go into a little bit more of the gasification fundamentals. Let's uh, revise our um, understanding of what is coal. So if you take a little bit of a coal, um, then what it is. As we have seen before, it's uh, essentially those bits, uh, ultimate analysis wise, uh, different ways of expressing it. Um, pulverized coal-fired power stations, CO2 in the flue gas, the concentration of CO2 in the flue gas is only about 13, 14, 15 percent at most. Rest is all nitrogen. All the nitrogen that you are feeding, 77 percent nitrogen that you are feeding along with coal, uh, air, uh, that comes out as nitrogen. So it reduces the volume and therefore you need to, in order to capture the CO2 from that flue gas, you have to, uh, but gasification, nitrogen is gone, oxygen only, so the volume is more concentrated. So you can get a lot higher, lot higher concentration of CO2. And uh, if you are doing the gasification at high pressure, PFI boiler operate at atmospheric pressure. If you do it at high pressure, then the partial pressure of CO2 is a lot higher than in PFI conditions. So from that point of view, CO2 kept, as a point I made, that is more, much more amenable to CO2 capture. Uh, the higher efficiency, correct. Efficiency can be higher, higher. Com
of liquid that you will have to handle, use, is also very, very high. Otherwise, you simply cannot uh, capture the CO2. But in here, your volume is less. Your concentration of CO2 is higher, so you need a lot less liquid to uh, uh, capture the CO2. If the conventional amine-based capture uh, technology is what you are planning to use. So the reason I showed those in here is that um, is that uh, apart from that, of course, we have this nastis, uh, sodium and chlorine, um, together with sulfur, and of course ash. So let's see how these, what happens to all of this, in during gasification. Uh, and then by ash, I mean, uh, if you can recall, uh, this is what is in ash. That's, uh, I mean, that's how we express the composition of the different compounds of the different elements in the ash. So let's take a little bit uh, back step and then um, talk about all the different kinds of solid fuels that we that exist at this point of time, apart from petroleum coke, uh, we you have um, if you plot these uh, fuels, locate these fuels in a in a matrix consisting of atomic oxygen to carbon ratio on the x-axis and atomic hydrogen to carbon ratio on the y-axis. Then biomass is on that side and anthracite is in this side. And the heating value increases as you go from right to left. So uh, as oxygen content decreases um, um, here, the uh, heating value increases. But that's only one side of the story. Reactivity is also another issue. And that means you, you cannot just um, use a fuel which is high, which has very high energy content in it, can you actually force it to gasify, which is the reactivity of it? That's another side of the story. That's very important to know. So this only tells only one side of the story. And again, each of those uh, consists of that composition of two varying, uh, two varying degree, right? Um, Let us uh, still digress a little bit. Uh, so all of those fuels that we showed in there, with the exception of the coal, which we have now separated into medium volatile, low volatile, uh, to um, uh, high volatile subbituminous and lignite. If you look at this and then look at their moisture and volatile matter and fixed carbon content, that is another way of designating, classifying the coal as we have seen proximate. That is, this is how it all looks like. Usually, these are the ones which are gasifiable coal. The ones on the right side, you will never touch them for gasification, even though they are higher heating, they have much higher heating value. The reason is they are not, their gasification reactivity is very, very poor. Um, so either you will need a lot of energy to be supplied to gasify them, or you will need a lot of time to gasify them, or, bo or both. So in as much as the heating value goes from left to right, sorry, yeah. Liquefaction is a, usually the subbituminous, bituminous, bituminous, because they have a lot less ash. Um, anthracite is not. Anthracite, the only way you can convert them is to very go for a special type of boilers and burn them. For, but gasification, no. Liquefaction, certainly no. Liquefaction also requires very low ash coal. So some low rank coals have low ash, but you have to dry them. Bituminous coals, in general, have less ash. 
don't need much drawing. So, liquefaction wise, let's go. high very high heating value because it's a, it's a lot of carbon you know. uh, yeah but hydrogen content is only about 4 5 percent so it doesn't change all that much so anthracite if you look at it's a lot of fixed carbon there and uh, that really uh, gives it a uh, very very high heating value But the hydrogen content in anthracite is a lot less. Uh, the volatile matter, if you see the box of volatile matter, the middle one, it is a lot less. So anthracite has, is a very mature coal. And over a long period of time, it has got rid of all the, uh, as it became mature, it has concentrated the fixed carbon. And it has got rid of a lot of the other other things, volatile matter as well. So, yeah, hydrogen content is about half uh, or slightly higher than half than in the bituminous coal, but the fixed carbon content is much, much higher, almost 90 percent, even more than 90 percent. So, let us keep this in mind. Uh, that what we are meaning in terms of um, the gasifiable coal. So, uh, and uh, I also have to bring you, uh, bring to your attention the low rank coals, because as I said before, low rank coals are very much amenable to gasification. Their gasification reactivity is higher. So, I, this, this same figures that I showed. Uh, yesterday, as part of this module, I am showing it. There will be few overlapping slides, so that you don't have to remember them. And it's on its entirety, this each module stands on its own. So, lowering coals are a major resource. About 45 percent of the global reserves are um, lowering coals. So, about 200 um, so that much. Uh, it's a huge reserves, 207 billion tons. Estimated resource is about, uh, there is a difference between resource and reserves. Uh, resource is about 1,000 gigaton, and these things uh, can change depending on the price of the uh, coal. Uh, if the price goes up, then the reserves go up. Uh, it's, uh, economically proven reserves go up. Um, and as I yeah. price So if the electricity price goes up for whatever reasons, then you will see a lot of different companies, they will start uh, developing new mines, new sources, all sorts of things. If the price is depressed, then they will not touch anything. So it's pure, purely economics. So the low rank coals are actually a strong part of many, many uh, countries' power generation. Um, and I have shown this in here, what actually low rank coal means. Low rank coal can mean many things. It can be high moisture, low ash, or low moisture, high ash, depending on where, uh, which countries you are talking about, they, uh, they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are located. So it's a very wide definition. Let's keep all of these things in mind, and then we'll start looking at, again, the um, uh, coal and the approximate analysis, et cetera. So if you take a chunk of coal, if you supply heat to it, let's focusing on the, moist, uh, the approximate analysis, what will happen is that, um, box, uh, that uh, the moisture with coal will first get dried, as we have mentioned before. And then um, <coughs> volatile matters will get pyrolyzed. Uh, the coal gets pyrolyzed. The devolatilization will take place. The so VM will go that way. You will get, and then what remains is char. And that char will then undergo gasification. So when we say coal gasification is actually predominantly char gasification, giving you certain products, gaseous products, 
added to that is the all the gaseous products that are coming from this middle step in here. Because the drying doesn't release any combustible gas as such. Okay. So sometimes you will see in the literature people talking about char gasification, sometimes people say coal gasification, but then if you see something coal gasification being written, then you will know that they are meaning everything that's coming from the coal, including the composition that comes during the pyrolysis stage. So for char gasification, uh, you need the source of oxygen. And that can come from either pure oxygen or partially, um, partially um, oxygen enriched air or st for, from steam. And depending on how you are supplying this oxygen, the thermodynamics will vary considerably. And therefore, the efficiency will vary considerably. Um, it also depends on what your purpose is. So char gasification, you will need either oxygen and stroke or steam. Coal gasification, what I'm saying is, coal gasification means this, the, the product, sorry, the products of coal gasification means the products coming from this stage and the products coming from this stage. But some papers, they will talk only about char gasification. That means they have eliminated that stage completely. So when you read the paper, you have to clearly see what they are actually talking about. Are they talking about the gasification of the char or gasification of the coal itself? In that case, second case, it will include both, the products of both. And devolatilization, as I said yesterday, uh, results in carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, hydrocarbon, everything. So that goes added to the products of char gasification from the fixed carbon uh, Gasification so, um, so that the problem that you are alluding to, uh, transportability of the char, etc., that becomes less lesser of an issue. So you devolatilize, get the product that way, and then take the char, remove the char into another reactor where you do only the gasification of the char. That is possible, that has been attempted. No, not problems like safety. I think if you are looking to preserve or utilize the products of pyrolysis separately from the products of char gasification, then that's how you will do, in two separate but adjacently located reactors. This all depends on what your objective is. Yeah, that would be the prime design. Yeah, separate product. Yes, that's right, that's right. Because the products from here, yesterday afternoon when I was telling that um, devolatilization, volatile matter can be varying depending on what temperature you are doing the pyrolysis and how long you are doing the pyrolysis. If you continue the pyrolysis beyond 500 to 600 to 700 to 14, 1500, you will simply start getting more and more and more and more volatiles, right? And less and less and less fixed carbon. So it all depends on where your boundary is. So if you are running the gasifier at 900 degrees, then you will be getting whatever volatile matter you can get, maximum extent that you can get uh, from 900 degrees centigrade pyrolysis. No more than that. Whether you will even get that will depend on how long you have kept it at 900, right? So it all depends on that. So 
So, um, do uh, have you ever seen the barbecue fuel? Charcoal. Huh? Uh, when you we grew up, uh, you know, we didn't have gas cylinders coming in until we were in the university. Uh, that's only the Indian gases, and then you have to. Even today, it's, okay. So people are using charcoal, right? So you guys are very uh, fortunate generation. You don't know this. Uh, uh, during my mother's time, I mean, uh, they used to uh, put the charcoal into the wooden stove, and, uh, and not wooden stove, but the clay stove. And then, you know, the Ogniraj brand uh, <laughs> ovens and all, you mind it, and it somehow ignite the char. And there is the trick. In order to ignite the char, there has to be a little bit volatile. Otherwise, it will not ignite. So, whatever temperature you pyrolyze, some volatiles will remain. Less volatile will remain if you pyrolyze at higher temperature. More volatile will remain the less te uh, at lower temperature. So depending on uh, what temperature you have paralyzed, you have driven out majority of the original volatiles. What remains, you call that char. It's not free of volatiles, but it, of, it is largely free of the original amount of volatile. Okay. So that's a, uh, uh, the difference. It's, I cannot say that this is, um, this is the char and it is guaranteed zero volatile. No. Nothing with it is less. It's absolutely subjective. Put it in the TG and then you can see how much volatile matter is there. Possible, definitely possible. And I'll show all types of gasification reactions that are possible, including the reaction of carbon with hydrogen. Possible. And the most important thing that we will see, under what conditions that is possible. Not every condition, you will get everything, right? So, so I think you are right. I think I should have written there char gasification with oxygen and stroke or steam, but I should have written oxygen and stroke or steam and stroke or CO2. Because it, it does happen, actually, during the gasification. CO2 gasification does happen. In fact, I should have written it, so it's my mistake. In fact, um, uh, one, how many students have graduated with gasification PhD? One, two, three, four. Three students graduated, one uh, just submitted. They all done CO2 gasification, nothing else. In, uh, within, within my group. So I'll correct it. And then when I set, uh, put the PDF back again to all of you, I'll correct that one. OK. So, um, so it's a very important thing that uh, what really are the gasification agents? Uh, oxygen, CO2, and steam. Which slide is this? Somehow the slide number is not there. Okay. So some of these react plus um, the some of the homogeneous gas phase reactions also that take place. Uh, what that means is during the devolatilization, you are releasing the gases. And some of those gases can also react between them. So this, for example, char gasification with oxygen or steam or CO2, these are all heterogeneous reactions. Heterogeneous reactions means one of the two is in solid phase, and the other one is in gas phase. So that's why heterogeneous. But when both of them, uh, both the reactants are in the same phase, the gas phase, then you have the homogeneous gas phase reactions also going in. So let's um, uh, take um, uh, your attention to 
very uh, broadly what um, how gasification varies from combustion, what happens to the carbon uh, during the during the combustion versus during gasification. So combustion uh, carbon predominantly goes to carbon dioxide, little bit of unburned carbon monoxide, but during <coughs> the gasification it can go to carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, and carbon dioxide. And uh, that depends on the ratios of those, particularly CO, CO2, depends on the temperature uh, of uh, the gasification. What happens to the hydrogen? Uh, the hydrogen uh, in uh, the combustion, it goes as water vapor. The, in uh, the, other sense, the other way, it goes at, uh, predominantly as hydrogen, to some extent as water vapor, because some of the hydrogen uh, if they get a chance to react with the oxygen that's going in, they will be converted. Not 100%, but the designers make every attempt so the hydrogen can come out as hydrogen, not reacting with the oxygen to give water vapor. But it can happen, and does happen to some extent. Uh, nitrogen, that's the uh, beauty of it. In the combustion, it all comes out as um, uh, NOx, both NO, nitric oxide, and nitrogen dioxide. But uh, in gasification, it comes out at, uh, as elemental nitrogen, but also, and unfortunately, also as hydrogen cyanide and uh, ammonia. And, it, uh, and hydrogen cyanide is not a good molecule to <laughs> have in the mix, but it can happen. Uh, and then um, sulfur, as I said before, SOX in the combustion case and hydrogen sulfide and carbonyl sulfide in the, in the other case. Um, if it comes out as carbonyl sulfide, that's not a problem because carbonyl sulfide and steam can be reacted to form CO2 and hydrogen sulfide. And then that hydrogen sulfide can be uh, treated, uh, processed to give you elemental sulfur through the Klaus process. And then what happens to the oxygen inside the, inside the coal? I'm not talking about the um, externally added oxygen. In, um, in um, coal gasification, that oxygen goes together uh, as oxygen, but it then combines with the carbon to come out as carbon dioxide eventually. So you don't see anything, but in here, sorry, in, uh, in gasification, the coal oxygen loses its identity completely. It doesn't exist anymore at all. But oxygen is very less. Substoichiometric oxygen. That's the reason. That's the reason. Very negligible. Very negligible. It all depends on the Barnard design. So in the... Um, coal-fired boilers, the burners are designed in such a way that, uh, that the oxygen, the nitrogen doesn't, nitrogen in the air doesn't come uh, in, uh, in close proximity to the oxygen in the coal. So, um, so that the, and also the air is actually staged so that there is not much nitrogen at every uh, a large amount of nitrogen every uh, uh, level. There are special burner designs. In fact, it's a specialized area. It's called low NOx burners, which deliberately suppresses the temperatures near the burner uh, where NOx can form to the minimum quantity. But you still cannot avoid it. But that is completely uh, non-existent in the gasifier for two reasons. One is you are not supplying any uh, nitrogen from outside. Uh, you are supplying predominantly highly concentrated oxygen. So that 77% nitrogen, majority of it is avoided. Uh, so the thermal NOx is not much. Fuel NOx, little bit, but again, that's not really an issue if you are doing the gasification at a lower temperature compared to pulverized coal-fired boilers operation, where temperature can go to 15, 1600 degrees Celsius. So that's the advantage. But then obviously, not everything is um, uh, well and good always. 
if you avoid one problem, sometimes another problem comes out. So the nitrogen has to go with someone, and nitrogen goes with to, to mix with uh, hydrogen and carbon and produces hydro uh, hydrogen cyanide. Yeah, so uh, ideally you would not like to. Yeah, yeah. These are all the different options. But in general, in gasification, because you are not supplying air, you are supplying predominantly oxygen. So you are avoiding a lot of the air, nitrogen going into the high temperature environment of the gasifier anyway. So that really keeps the NOx level very, very down. I mean, below the permissible limits, usually. Not usually, always. So um, uh, it's not correct to say that not at all formed, but if it is very, very low, below the permissible limits, so that the EPA will not be any factor. This is due to the fuel nitrogen, so it's coming. So everything in here, what uh, of what is inside the fuel, in that black thing in the middle. Carboxylic, correct. So eventually it comes out. Eventually it goes out as CO two, but if you are also giving additional oxygen somehow then it will all come out as excess oxygen. So in the combustion process, eventually runs at uh, excess oxygen level, 4%, 5%. So even though the fuel oxygen is completely eliminated, there are other oxygen coming from the um, air, and that goes out as pure oxygen, CO2. Uh, less as CO in during the oxygen uh, during the uh, combustion, it will go out as CO2. Breakage of carboxylic groups completely consumed. The fuel oxygen will be completely consumed, and uh, and also the additional oxygen that you are giving as a reactant that will also be completely consumed. Okay. Yeah. True. Uh, the fuel oxygen, there is actually, uh, there are a few, quite a few studies who are looking at the, at, uh, at the um, type of oxygen, the, uh, where the oxygen comes out and how it comes out during gasification. How much, what is the CO, CO2 ratio it comes out. So there's a whole range of fundamental studies people have done to uh, look at the mechanistic, uh, uh, get the mechanistic insight, but, um, but predominantly it comes out as CO2 carboxylic groups. They break quite early during the pyrolysis phase when the particle is still uh, experiencing lower temperature in the first few uh, milliseconds. The fly ash um, can, uh, in the combustion case, of course, has come, has come out as fly ash particulate. It has to be eventually <coughs> captured in the bottom ash hopper um, or in the back filter of the electrostatic precipitator. But whatever be the case, they come out as fly ash, fine particles. Huh? But uh, depending on the type of the gasifier um, from the gasification plant, it will come out either as a slag or as a dry ash, depending on what type of gasifier you are using. And we'll, I'll spend a fair bit of time on that. Yeah, so, um, uh, so in the furnace, slagging happens for one particular reason, and the gasifier uh, slagging happens for a different reason. So slagging gasifiers in train flow gasifiers, same. And uh, that's a whole range of, uh, yeah, uh, that in, in itself is a big field. And that's why I will have a separate module only for the slagging bit. 
So let's then uh, look at all the different, uh, the, the major reactions that take place when coal goes in. So um, uh, the fuel goes in, uh, that's the middle box say is gasifier, oxygen goes in and steam goes in, also carbon dioxide can go in too, if, if, you, if you bring in carbon dioxide. Um, but even if carbon dioxide doesn't go in there, carbon dioxide still is in here and then can still react. The carbon dioxide coming from the pyrolysis. Okay. So, say solid fuel or whatever. So the first one is the exothermic reaction. It produces a lot of heat. And um, then uh, you have certain other reactions in here which produces this combustible constituents, CO and hydrogen, these are all endothermic, then um, if hydrogen can be made to react with carbon under the right conditions, right conditions mean high pressure, then you can get methane as well, which is an exothermic part, only if that happens. Water gas shift reaction can happen theoretically because inside the gasifier CO and H2O is present. To what extent it will happen depends on the temperature inside the gasifier. If it is high temperature, not much happens. You can make it to happen later on. Then the other one is the methanation reaction, CO reacting with um, hydrogen. Again, uh, that produces uh, methane, but that requires also very high pressure, usually 25, 30 bar, certainly well more than, uh, much more than 25 bar, so 30 bar or so. So depending on the pressure, some of these reactions may be negligible, may have negligible contribution, some of these may have good contribution. Yeah. Sorry? Now that a lot of focus is on CO2 capture and there is enormous volume of CO2, so a lot of the focus is shifting now is to um, uh, whether some of the CO2 can be brought back or not, uh, uh, ma making it heated and then uh, uh, put it back into to get the, CO, the Bordeaux reaction uh, which is over there. The gasification with CO2 is called the Bordeaux reaction. So this, uh, um, it all depends really. If you want to use, in, on, in theory it's a good idea to have CO2 reacting and not supplying and uh, not, uh, not doing steam gasification, but then where will the heat come from? Otherwise uh, reaction will not go and Bordeaux reaction doesn't start until very well until about 900 degrees anyway. So all the temperature up to 900 has to be supplied somehow. Possible if you are doing the gasification at 1100 or 1200 or 1300, then you cool the gas down. In the process, you heat up the CO2 and bring it back again. So when the steady state has reached, it is possible. But up until the steady state has reached, you'll have to have another source of heat. And that heat will predominantly, predominantly 
come from this combustion. So some in gasifier, what will invariably happen is that some of the carbon in the coal has to be combusted to give you this CO2 and in the process release enormous amount of heat. Fortunately, this releases enormous amount of heat compared to the other ones which are lower on a kilo per kilo mole basis. So that's the advantage. So some of the carbon converted to CO2 is unavoidable in gasification, but not all as happens in uh, combustion. Uh, yes, so from pyrolysis it will come. Uh, methane and a little bit of C2, C3, etc., but not much beyond C4 or so. Very little. But you can get additional methane from this reaction, methanation reaction, or hydrogen, provided you are running the gasifier at a very high pressure. There are instances where gasifier has to be operated at 50 bar for, for other reasons. There you will get this as well. But CXHY, other than CH4, will be very low, small component in general, but very, very low. So steam has to be supplied. So this steam has to be supplied from somewhere. So one option is to supply it from the gas cooler. You cool down the gas with water. The water becomes steam. You bring the steam back. As I showed before lunch in that um, schematic. OK. Oxyphil combustion. True. So you have to supply a certain amount of uh, in oxyphil combustion. Oxyphil combustion will have a module on that. In oxyphil combustion, it, it means. Um, you are trying to do the combustion in combustion, not gasification, in presence of, uh, in absence of nitrogen. So, so the nitrogen is uh, there is actually then replaced by, for maintaining the flame temperature, for controlling the flame temperature, nitrogen has to be replaced by another inert gas, which is CO2. Okay. So that's a different, uh, different scenario. I will, we'll come to that. We'll have a uh, smaller module on oxyphil combustion. So the point to make is that these are the major gases, and these are the smaller components. Nevertheless, they are very important components, uh, so in the sense that they are all bad. Uh, but they are all pollutants. So you need to get rid of those. So in as much as they are inevitably produced, you need to get uh, 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 spend some effort to reduce them below the permissible limits. And that's not inconsequential. So we'll see. Uh, usually, if, um, um, these are in the PPM range, 100, 150 PPM range, sometimes smaller than that. This can be, can be quite high, depending on percentage, and 1% or so uh, by volume, depending on the sulfur content in the coal. But that's a non-issue, really, because uh, in, from the gasifier, the hydrogen, from the hydrogen sulfide, you can capture the elemental sulfur. So that's a good thing, good problem to have. The sulfur sells at a high price.
This actually happens, and that the hydrogen uh, hydrogen doesn't come in contact with this oxygen. Yes, but hydrogen is much much more valuable item than this. So I, just to give you an example, as I said before lunch. The methane uh, sells at about hundred dollars a kilogram, but hydrogen sells at a lot more than thousand dollars a kilogram. So you want to preserve the hydrogen, and that's a question of design. Not uh, uh, with the, with with chemistry behind it. So the chemistry tells you that if hydrogen comes in contact with oxygen, it will, you will be a problem. Then you, your task as an engineer to, is to make it happen. The hydrogen doesn't come into contact with uh, oxygen, right? So that's the gasifier design strategy. And we, I'll be spending some time on that as well. So let's see um, some of the simple variables how they affect the formation of um, these components. Uh, in the in the in the major components in here, how they are affected by two major variables, which are temperature and pressure. So, in general, what happens is if temperature goes um, goes up and pressure goes up, so this these two arrows are there. If temperature goes up, the water vapor goes down. Hydrogen will go up. CO will go up. CO2 will also go up, methane will go, uh, sorry, go down, CO2 uh, methane will go down, but if pressure goes up, water vapor is formed more, hydrogen goes down, this also goes down, this goes, uh, remains more or less unchanged, but this goes up. So, if hydrocarbon production is your objective, you will definitely go for higher pressure. So that's the bottom line from here. Okay. Um, so, um, and, and you will need a very, very high pressure, 50, 60 bar, like that. If power production, gas turbine based power production is your focus, then you will get away with 20 bar, maximum 25 bar, so that the gas turbine uh, sees at least 20 bar uh, pressure gas going into it, not more than that. Uh, and um, and um, and uh, that you still get a good amount of combustible constituents, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, uh, with the, and that will give you a certain so that you get a certain uh, calorific value in megajoules per kilogram wise that is combustible in the gas turbine. So, for example. Um, the gas turbine manufacturers will tell you that uh, as a rule of thumb they require about 3.8, 3.7 megajoules per kilogram. However you have it, with whatever combination of hydrogen, CO and methane you have it doesn't matter to them all that much, but you need minimum that much in order to have a stable combustion in commercial scale gas turbines, 3.8. So if you are generating from say biomass gasification or anything, four megajoules per kilogram is fine. Six, seven, even better. To get over 10 megajoules per kilogram requires a lot of effort. Massive, uh, very good understanding of, um, uh, of uh, gasifier design so that you can extract almost every uh, molecule of carbon monoxide and hydrogen and methane from there, uh, completely eliminating the effect of um, the oxygen, scavenging of those two. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah. But the problem is that hydrogen molecular weight is only two. 
So even if you have uh, volumetric composition wise, a lot of hydrogen in the gas compared to carbon monoxide and methane. Carbon monoxide is 28 and this methane is uh, 16 and hydrogen is 2 only. So even though hydrogen's uh, um, calorific value is much higher, its overall contribution to the calorific value is on a per kilogram basis will be a lot less. So that's the thing. If it is 100% hydrogen, then obviously it will be very, very good. But that never will happen. Megajoules per kilogram. Correct. Correct. If that doesn't is not satisfied, then obviously you will not be able to use the gas turbines. turbine may not cope with. So you need to control the temperature. What do you do? You bring back some of the nitrogen from the air separation plant back in the entry stage of the uh, gas turbine, moderate it there. So not wasting, but it's correct, compressed nitrogen. Uh, it, it adds to the mass flow and therefore to some extent the kilowatt or the megawatt electricity that you get. But, um, but that's the, so if you don't need it, don't bring it. And if you don't need it, then you have to go for the higher class gas turbines. Uh, but then that will obviously come at a cost. Higher class gas turbines are not cheap. Yeah. So, um, so what's happening is that the gasifier, sorry, gas turbine manufacturers will specify, I need this much megajoule per kilogram or this much megajoule per normal meter cube. They specify on that basis. So you then see from the gasifier's perspective. Now, they will not necessarily always do it, but you can find it out. And you can, when you do the simulations uh, using commercial packages, uh, I have used ThermoFlow um, together with Aspen Plus, marrying them together considerably during my industry days. Um, so you choose the gas turbine, and then immediately you can find it from there how much you, you, you require, uh, how much temperature. Uh, it will, where it will bomb out, so you can make that guess from there. Even though they don't say it ex uh, explicitly, you can find it from there. And then that will then tell you how much bleed nitrogen you have to bring back in from the air separation plant. So if you need the know the nitty gritties, you don't. You can find if you, in life you can find anything if you put uh, prepared to put a weight uh, effort behind it. So they will not definitely know. But uh, they are becoming a lot more and more. Um, they have to. 
otherwise competition will kill them. There is no competition, they can uh, um, remain silent and then simply ignore you. More competition, they will be forced to divulge. So. No, this is just thermodynamic equilibrium. So kinetics we haven't. So I haven't even come to kinetics yet. And um, the uh, half of yesterday's afternoon, I kept on telling combustion is very fast, gasification is very slow, and I haven't even come to that. So I'll come to that. So gasification is a very involved thing. It's uh, uh, in as much as combustion has its fair share of problems to ash deposition, fouling, slagging, etc. Uh, gasification has its other complications. So it's uh, nothing in life is easy. So whatever we have discussed in the previous slide, in all these down arrows, up arrows, etc., visually it becomes a lot easier uh, to put this into a figure form, right? So in here, in the x-axis you have the pressure, and in the y-axis you have the uh, volumetric percentage or mole percentage of the gaseous products that are formed, the major gaseous products that are forming. CO, CO, CO2, hydrogen, methane, etc. So the point that we made is that um, if, uh, if you increase pressure, then certain components do increase. Methane and uh, water vapor and uh, to some extent um, CO2 as well. Uh, but uh, the other components do decrease, particularly carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So it really depends on your overall objective, what you want. Um, if you don't want a lot of methane, then obviously you will not go towards high pressure at all. Because running a plant a gasifier at high pressure comes at a cost. Comes at a cost means how do you actually pressurize it and then not only that, you maintain the pressure. Uh, maintaining a gasifier at high pressure, at that sort of pressure, is not an easy task. Even though much easier than uh, maintaining uh, pressure if at all required in a PFI plant, a uh, PFI boiler. But still, it's a considerable effort that he will require because he will have to generate the oxygen at that pressure first. Um, the cryogenic air separation plants, the oxygen has to come predominantly from the cryogenic air separation plants and then you have to compress it, that uh, consumes a lot of power, and then you feed it you know, uh, with uh, oxygen going at a high pressure, and possibly with also with high temperature. It's a dangerous thing. Um, high temperature and high pressure oxygen can burn anything. All sorts of metals it, it can burn. Yeah. So instead of oxygen, if you steam, if you use high pressure steam, you still have to supply the heat. So how do you supply heat at high pressure? You have to fall back on oxygen. Yeah. So if you, um, uh, so say you put put high pressure steam, high pressure steam. Say, if, for example, if you put, as an example, if you put 50 bar steam, then you are looking at a tremendous degree of superheat uh, uh, for the to raise it to the gasification temperature. So where will that superheat source come from? So it's far easier to rather than supplying the heat externally, far easier to generate it internally. So part of the syngas can be cooled outside and then, and then can come back here again with a little bit of extra pressurization. But highly flammable gas, which syngas is, pressurizing it is another uh, technology, technological challenge. So the uh, easiest uh, route is to uh, generate the heat inside, and that comes at a cost that part of the carbon has to be combusted with the oxygen.
to generate the heat. Um, uh, yeah, in a way it is, but uh, the majority of the all the gasifiers are, even though you see a single volume reactor, but essentially they are two stages, and we will see that when we look at the GE's gasifier versus transport reactor versus fluidized demand. So, we will see that. Yeah, so we actually did, um, uh, there is a case, 27 different cases that I, um, then there is a book on uh, the science and technology of Victorian brown coal, uh, it is available. The chapter 7 that I wrote back in, I forgot, 97, 98 maybe. So, that is that's one of the cases that you do the air, um, sorry, you do the atmospheric pressure gasification, cool down the gas, then you uh, compress it. So, that has its plus and minuses. Uh, uh, no, water gas shift reaction is theoretically independent of pressure because is a CO plus H2O going to CO2, so 1 plus 1. So, no change in the number of moles. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, 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 I have formed the idea that pressurized fluidized bed gasification is a very bad idea <laughs> completely. Uh, it is much easier to do with everything in atmospheric pressure, but then again depends on what your uh, objective is. Um, so, if chemicals production is, uh, uh, is, the, um, is the focus, then you need high pressure. Some of the reactions, chemical reactions, uh, synthesis reactions if I may call it, say production of the methanol or dimethyl ether or anything. Every reaction has, a, has three parts. One is the initiation. That means, you will have to entice it to come and react. Okay. So, that initiation period can be very, very long at low pressure. So, you need pressure. Sometimes, some of the reactions will not even start at less than 50 bar. So, um, and at pressure, it, uh, the molecules become so intensely mixed. So, you need pressure sometimes. So, it depends on where you exert that pressure, at the gasifier end or at the other end. That is a question of economics, that is a question of process simulation, then yeah. doing the economics. I think you should be, yeah, Prefer um, uh, preferably you will be doing the gasification at a lower pressure. Lower pressure does not mean atmospheric pressure, lower pressure can mean slightly elevated, so one or two bars, uh, but it is still amenable. And then you cool down the gas and do whatever you want to do with it, shift it, otherwise then, then compress it. But in order to compress it, you know the compressor's power goes up as soon as the temperature goes up. So, if you comp want to compress a gas, you will have to compress uh, and cool it down to ambient level. So, it is it's more of a heat integration uh, strategy. So, theoretically there will be a lot of benefits, but whether this one is good or that one is good is hard to say until such time we have done the done the actual simulation and then the cost calculations. But in principle, in principle doing the uh, uh, gasification at lower pressure is very favorable, because 
handling the feed material, putting them into the gasifier becomes so much easier when you do it at low pressure. Coal feeding at high pressure um, is a challenge. I spend a lot of my night shifts banging the bottom of the lock hoppers in North Dakota in December, the snowing time, uh, period, to feed the coal at 10 bar, 15 bar, etc. So feeding wise, it becomes a lot easier to do it that way. So that's why we run our gasifier system at atmospheric pressure. Because why should I unnecessarily create an engineering problem and solve it while the actual, uh, at high pressure, everything becomes compact. But maintaining a high pressure environment is not easy. Every joint, every connection has to be absolutely airtight. And, uh, and you know, oxygen has, oxygen and water vapor has the uncanny ability to go against the stream, against the pressure, to leak in slightest amount. So, it, hmm? steam. Through the capillary action. So, uh, in, in principle, uh, a lower pressure operation is uh, preferable. But then you really you have to do case by case simulation. There is not a single black and white. coke and then go for um, higher pressure uh, methanol synthesis. It's pressure all the way through. But then again, that's, uh, that's, uh, this all um, uh, depends on what your feedstock is. If your feedstock is coal, doing pressurized gasification with coal is not easy. Feeding the coal consistently is a major challenge. Both. Both. Shell does dry feed. So dry feeding at high pressure is very, very challenging. So that's why G, before that it was Texaco, they went for slurry feeding. Because slurry feeding is, um, uh, it is so much easier to pump it to high pressure, 50, 60 bar easily. Because there the rheology is dominated by liquid uh, rather than solid. But then that comes at a cost. Because in the gasifier, you're putting in huge amount of water. So the calorific. So there was a, um, there was a considerable amount, amount of um, research uh, dollars spent, DOE's money, US Department of Energy's money, in developing a dry pump. It's called Stamet pump. DOE's funding, uh, a private company developed it, S-T-A-M-E-T. -E I don't think you will Google them and find any more. G bought it after considerable development. And then the solid feeding pump um, at high pre pressurized feeding of the solids. Uh, it's called Stemet pump, but it's for gasifier design. And uh, G bought it and then Everyone became tight-lipped. I kept on asking a lot of people, do you know what's happening in Stamet Pump? Everyone said, mm, why are you asking it? So, um, so anyway, uh, outside this room, I will talk about I can talk about it. So, so, uh, there are a whole lot of things. And there, there are a lot of things that uh, goes beyond science and technology. And uh, you know, so. anyway, so. <laughs> So, and then there is, this is another way of looking at it. The y-axis remains the same. The x-axis becomes the temperature. And what happens, what's the effect of the temperature? So essentially, whatever was there in the previous slide, this is just in the graphical form. And I have taken this all from a book written by two individuals um, uh, with whom um, 
one of them is actually is actually my mentor, and I keep. Uh, he's my also my co-advisor uh, for the government projects, uh, Christopher Higman and Martin Vanderbart from X Shell. Uh, that book is available in the library's um, gasification. Yeah, so it was written predominantly by uh, Martin Vanderbart, the Dutchman, um, but it, its focus is completely different. I mean, uh, because they are they are the hands-on practitioners who wrote that particular book. This is by far the one. So I met uh, Christopher last year uh, in, uh, in Co at Cologne, uh, in Berlin, sorry, in the gasification conference, and then um, he was he did not have the time to make an update of that because that book is from 2001, but it's one of the brilliant books you will ever find in gasification. The practical issues in as much as he could divulge, he di did divulge. Higman. He runs his own consultancy now, Higman Consultancy. Higman Consultants. So then next go to the, this slide. I have only put three, um, three um, uh, variables there, but it will be very, very important. Um, very important. So we talk about CO2 gasification, steam gasification, air gasification, oxygen blown gasification, uh, fantastic names and all. But one thing is very important in gasification is to control the temperature. If for some reason temperature varies, uh, these uh, slides are, by the way, are they are available now al already. So um, I'll make a little bit of a change and re put them again, but you should be able to get them. Um, temperature control is a massively important issue. I tell you why. So I have a gasifier, and downstream of it I have a chemical synthesis rig, which requires carbon monoxide and hydrogen at a different, at a particular ratio all the time. Otherwise, chemical synthesis, uh, you will not get it. Uh, what do you want? Okay. So that depends on the how the how controllably the gasifier is running. If for Coal related reasons, I mean the ash chemistry related reasons, the agglomeration is one thing, even though we talked about that in the context of combustion, but similar problems can happen. Ash related problems, let me say that. If ash related problems start to occur and go beyond a certain limit, uncontrollable limit, the temperature will swing. If temperature swings, what will happen? As we showed in the previous slide, my gas composition will vary. Right? Some gases will be, be dominating more now. Some will be dominating less. So your downstream production process will suffer unless you have a storage of consistent quality of gas. So the temperature control in a gasifier is extremely, extremely important. So then the question is, how do you do it? Because you are supplying oxygen, even the substoichiometric oxygen. Even then, it, will, it is an exothermic reaction that it is um, uh, generating. So temperature will tend to run away unless you control the temperature. So in order to control the temperature, then what you do? You bring in steam or you bring in carbon dioxide. Or you bring in nitrogen, but that will defeat the purpose. Either way. So let's then take you bring in the, uh, the uh, condition where you are bringing in steam, not for gasification, but for temperature control. Then what it will do is it will control the temperature. You can calculate in order to control the temperature at x degrees of gasification temperature, how much steam will you need. That's easy. 
simple heat transfer calculation. Left side, left hand side, right hand side balancing. Okay. Then you will have to see, okay, this steam will control my temperature, but it is also going to whether it is also going to affect my reaction or not, because we have seen C plus steam will give you carbon monoxide and hydrogen, right? Um, so, so you will find that lot of the steam that you are giving for uh, temperature control is far in excess of what you require for C plus steam reaction. So, what will happen to that water vapor? It will simply dilute the gas. Of course, it will control the temperature. Of course, it will give rise to some amount of reaction with the carbon, but predominantly it will go out. So, then the situation then is, okay, instead of steam, I, can I control the temperature with CO2? In order to control the temperature, uh, not as a temperature in, in, in where you have the carbon uh, to uh, oxygen reaction happening just over there, it's at the bed. So, if you do that, um, so C plus, so, so that C plus uh, H2O uh, steam reaction, if you then consider that, okay, now I will control the temperature by CO2 then it will give rise to, it will control the temperature, but it will also give rise to boardward reaction, C plus CO2 giving you CO. So, you will then have to think, is this additional CO that it is giving, is it going to affect my gas composition or not? Because if it does so, then you will have to have some other means of controlling the temp, uh, composition after the gasifier in a, some kind of a reactor, which can be a shift reactor. The point I am trying to make is, we read so much about carbon steam reaction in the literature, but in reality in large gasifier, steam is given predominantly to check the temperature, keep the temperature in control, because temperature control is paramount. If temperature swings, the gas composition will start swinging and there will be all sorts of other, uh, other um, uh, consequences. In small rigs in the laboratory, that's, those are lesser of an issue really, because we are heating the bed by external means, electrical means or natural gas jacketed means. So, heating it is not a problem, but in a real commercial gasifier, where heat is generated internally from the partial combustion of the carbon, there in order to temp keep the temperature in control, you will need to supply a lot of steam or lot of carbon dioxide or both, which will then have other effects on the carbon steam reaction or the carbon CO2 reaction. So, those have to be appreciated. So, the point that I am making is lower the gasification temperature, better is the so called cold gas efficiency, but then you will need to supply lot of temperature controlling fluids, either steam or CO2 or in a completely unpreferable, non preferable scenario nitrogen. So, that needs to be kept in mind, which also means if your gasification temperature is higher, temperature control becomes slightly lesser of an issue and therefore, you will not be needing as much additional carbon dioxide or additional steam to be put in. So, these are some very important aspects to appreciate and to be kept in mind. I do not have the capacity to put them in writing, that is why I have stopped from writing. I thought I will put this and then discuss and then whatever you keep in mind, you keep in mind. But that is the important scenario. You will not get it right, you see it in any 
textbook, unfortunately. If someone helps me in writing the chapter on it, then I, I can make, uh, give co-authorship to, the, to that person. But it needs to be put in. I don't have the time. OK, so, so the point I'm making is the, these are all interrelated, uh, completely interrelated aspects, uh, which one uh, needs to keep in mind. If you are then on the other side of the story is that if you are doing um, the higher temperature gasification, 11, 12, 13, 1400 degrees, sometimes you have to do it because the nature of the carbon is such that um, the, you require higher temperature to force it to gasify. Even the carbon or the char coming from the low rank coals, we say the low rank coals are very uh, good reactive coals, etc up to a point. What happens is, when the char gets pyrolyzed, uh, sorry, coal gets pyrolyzed, and char is prepared, if that is prepared at the high temperature, then it's, the matrix of the carbon becomes more and more ordered, structured. So it becomes more and more difficult to gasify. So you'll see a lot of papers wherein they look at the effect of the char effect on the char reactivity of the pyrolysis temperature and that's not done as a scientific curiosity factor it's done for a proper reason the point is if you are preparing your char at high temperature um, then invariably that char will have less reactivity for all sorts of reasons. Therefore, you will need higher temperature in the gasifier. That's another reason why a lot of the gasifiers, majority of the large gasifiers are all entrained flow gasifiers. That's one of the reasons. Hmm? So, the, because the char becomes less reactive. So in order to, volatile matter has left, its structure has become more ordered. Therefore, you require uh, um, uh, higher temperature for the oxygen to uh, react with it. And therefore, you need higher temperature gasification. Or in that case, it will be the so-called entrained flow gasification. Um, so but technically, it can be high, very high temperature fluidized bed gasification as well, technically, but practically not. And we'll see that, I think, in the next slide or in the slide after that. So the point I'm making is gasification temperature is important. Gasification temperature has a lot of effects. Gasification temperature has effect on the char reactivity. Gasification temperature has effect on the... Um, uh, 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 on the requirement of steam or CO2 or the temperature moderating agents. And that, those have consequential effect on the actual reaction that gives you the products that you want, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So these are all interrelated plays. Um, temperature rea near the reaction zone. So that can be that can be near the, in the bed as well as just over bed, even in the expanded bed. So if it is a fluidized bed, and I come to that, but let's digress a bit. If it is a fluidized bed, then obviously there is a, a dense bed, and then there is a um, expanded bed in both regions. Correct. So fluidized beds, in general, they maintain um, um, they maintain more uniform temperature, but uh, because of the constant fluidization, provided they can be made to have constant fluidization. Um, uh, by, so in general, the temperature inside the fluidized beds, you can say that they will be more homogeneous compared to the fixed bed.
what you said. So what he was saying is, um, say you have a you have a TGA and you have a drop tube furnace, both operated at say 1100 Celsius. You can have uh, drop uh, TGA operating at 1250. We operate; it's not a problem. The drop tube furnace also operates at uh, AM. In TGA is a fixed bed because you put the sample in the crucible. Then, then you heat it up, 10 degrees centigrade per minute. It's a slow heating. Okay, particle size can be very fine, not a problem. In the drop tube furnace, it is different. Drop tube furnace, the furnace is already heated. In TGA, it's not heated. The particle the the, the particle gets heated as you heat the uh, TGA furnace. So, so the two configurations are completely different even though the final temperature is the same. This is already at high temperature and ambient temperature cold particle or fluid uh, fuel particle goes in and then it experiences this tremendous thermal shock. It gets fractured and therefore it just develops a lot more porosity. But at the same time these fractured particles because they have fractured they also experience very, very high temperature. In TGA, it experiences very high temperature slowly. Here, it experiences high temperature very rapidly. And this char has different reactivity than the char generated here, simply because the heating mode is different. The heating rate at which they are exposed to are different. So that's the point that you are trying to make. So studies on TGA prepared char and their reactivity, they serve a purpose, but they are far away from reality. Even though they do show, give you certain information effect of the heating rate, slow heating rate, what it makes, what effect it has on the reactivity of the char. But in reality, the situation is different. So I'm not saying that the, all the TGA papers are rubbish. It's not because they give you some very important information that if you prepare the char in a way different to the char that will be prepared inside a gasifier, you will not be exploring the right problem. So best thing is to do is to do it in the drop tube furnace and then uh, explore it there straight away. Because it becomes, um, uh, it, it gets the chance to become structured uh, the, uh, as a consequence of very fine and fine and fine particles resulting from the fragmentation, which is resulting from the thermal shock. Nothing else. But, but if you are that again, there is a but. If you are drop tube furnace is giving it only one or two seconds, lesser of an issue. But if your drop tube furnace is giving it full 10 seconds or 12 seconds, as is typical in commercial scale gasifiers, that's what intent for gasifiers will require. It will become a bit more, bit more um, um, structured. And that char, partially you will be able to, uh, it's much better actually to um, combust it inside the gasifier. So the C plus O2, that reaction that takes place, is actually not the coal, uh, it's not the coal, it's actually that char. And I will show you in the next uh, two or three slides, uh, uh, two or three slides later, what I actually mean. 
Any other questions? It is a theoretical option, but in a practical large scale application it is not an option, because indirect heating means you will have to have a jacketed gasifier, right. And uh, you know maintaining, designing a jacketed gasifier is fine, smaller um, indirectly heated pyrolyzer is fine, but then an indirectly heated jacketed gasifier operating at 900 or so a large one will be a challenge and then uh, so that that will be the issue but theoretically uh, possible correct so so, so um, in order to have 900 degrees inside the gasifier um, um, you will have to have higher temperature gas running and you know, circulating in your um, jacket. So, those calculations can be made, but um, though I think those will rea uh, remain in the realm of um, scientific curiosity rather than large scale application. Really. But there will be definitely a benefit if economics can justify it, there will be a benefit in the sense that it, it will not be having any carbon dioxide, C plus O2, that reaction is completely gone. Right, so there will be that benefit. There is absolutely no doubt about it. But it's a good question, very, very good, good question. I think. Sorry, say again. Ah, that one. Yeah. Right. inside the temp for temperature control i'm just trying to think um, uh, as i say they will have an effect on the gas composition so if you are cooling it with co2 then you will be you can forget about hydrogen co2 will be so much higher as uh, co will be so much higher hydrogen will not be less uh, it will be not be much 
but if you are cooling with steam injected to it, then hydrogen will be higher. Um, correct. So, I, I mean, I do not know whether there is either this is better or that is better, really. You really have to do the simulation, Aspen Plus or whatever, however means, and then find it out. Because you are how you are generating the temperature in the first place by injecting oxygen. So, if you put oxygen and nothing else, temperature will be a lot higher than 900 degrees or whatever you want to mention, or whatever you want to maintain. So that's why you need to inject the moderating agent, whatever that is. But you know, this is in reality in in large. Uh, real gasifiers. For laboratory based investigations, we usually control the temperature with electrical heating. There it will be non existent. So, in as much as it will not reflect reality, it will still give you some information under controlled condition. What I am discussing here is about what can happen in large commercial gasifiers. The bottom line is, if you are doing high temperature gasification, you need lot less steam. In large scale gasifiers, high temperature gasifier, you do not need much steam at all, and sometimes you do not need any steam at all. Um, uh, but um, if you uh, operate a small, uh, I mean, a large fluidized bed gasifier, you will have to inject a lot of steam. And, and that is what I experienced myself, high temperature Winkler gasifier plant and, um, and, and maintaining it is not an easy task. Because what steam does is not only it controls the temperature which is fine, but it also gives rise to the, uh, rise to the higher levels of hydrogen. It also gives rise to a reducing environment in the ash. Uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the ash and then the, ash, the ashes then started behave, start behaving wildly. So, on that let us come to this type of gasifier. So, the way I discuss it with everyone is uh, this from my personal experience. Say you take a chunk of coal, you nicely burn it 550 degrees or so. So, nothing has volatilized, just the carbon is gone, you have developed this much ash. Take that ash and then start hitting it. And then somehow you plot it here in this arbitrary two dimensions. The first dimension is the x axis, the temperature, and the second dimension I am calling it character of the ash. So, I call it ash character. So, ash character you can measure it different ways. So, I have, uh, I have taken some ash, put it in here, and then across that say I have put a, uh, two pressure, trans I mean pressure transducers. So, I am just measuring the pressure drop across the ash bed as I am hitting it. What will happen then is, so my y axis is say ash character represented as pressure drop measurement across the bed of ash. This is something that you will see. And literally this is what you will see, if you are able to do it, because I have done it. Up to a certain temperature, whatever temperature it is, does not matter. The ash character, the pressure drop across it will be predictable, rising, but nicely rising, so I can measure it, not a problem. And on the other side, beyond the other side as well, the pressure uh, drop is also very predictable, very smooth, not a problem. So, on either side, it is very, very predictable, not a problem. It is in the middle where it starts behaving wildly. So, what I say is that I can separate the ash behavior into three temperature zones. I am not telling what temperatures are they. I am saying there is a low temperature zone, a high temperature zone, 
and summer a middle temperature zone. On either side, low and high temperatures, very predictable. In the middle zone, it's a dangerous area, and I call it. Um, so in here, if you operate, then you will get the ash in dry form. Somewhere here, the ash will become not, not just dry, but they will also sinter. Sinter means on the surface, changes are taking place. And on the other side, the ash will come out as molten slag. Now, Forget about the slagging that we discussed this time yesterday. But this is what will happen. And this is what I tell to everyone, the industry people as well as the researchers, that if you are given the choice of a selection of a gasifier, you need to know your coal first. By that, proximate analysis, ultimate analysis, ash analysis, sulfur, chlorine, etc. But then, more importantly, also you, the behavior of the ash somehow. And it can be done. How? So this is the zone. I call it it's a no entry zone, similar to the no entry zone for cars. This is the zone that you would try to avoid the operation of the gasifier if you can. If you cannot, then that's a different thing. Um, good luck to you, but um, you know that's how it is. So this is depending on that. The three major types of gasifiers have actually been uh, defined, uh, even though they do not explicitly um, uh, say it this way. So we have on one side the dry ash uh, fixed bed gasifiers. Sometimes it is called moving bed gasifiers. Moving bed and fixed bed gasifiers, even though they mean different, but they are actually the same. What it means is that the bed itself remains fixed, but it, it's as a bed, it, it's not changing. It's just moving. It's fixed, but it is moving as a whole. So that's why it is moving bed or fixed bed. Uh, it is called. That operates here, more or less, in the low temperature zone. Then on the other side, you have um, the fluidized bed gasifiers, where temperature is controlled, uh, very, very uniform, as you can see, next to each of these types. You also have a temperature versus height of the gasifier, that plane. Okay. Here, it is more or less constant. And that can operate at a certain temperature zone. I'll come to that. And then you have the so-called entrained flow gasifiers, where the particles are fine, temperature is very high, and temperature is very, very uniform, uh, entrained for gasifier, as uniform as you want to keep it. Depending on, depending on, so these three figures I have taken from the IES uh, clinical centers uh, publications, you can see, depending on where you are operating, if you are operating here, it is fixed bed. If you are operating here, then it is slagging gasifier or entrained flow gasifier. So where does the fluidized bed gasifiers fit in? The fluidized bed gasifiers have to fit in, subject to knowing the ash character very, very well, has to fit in, not here, but somewhere very close to this place. So it's a very narrow temperature zone that the fluidized bed gasifiers need to operate. And for due to lack of operating experience, I'm talking about the larger ones. The smaller lab-based ones not a problem. Lack of experience, ill luck, bad luck from your previous life or whatever. Um, if, you have, <laughs> if you go beyond this narrow temperature zone, 
into in here, you forget about the gasifier. And that's precisely what happened to me. When I was running the pressurized high temperature Winkler gasifier, being told by my predecessors, fluidized bed gasifiers are the way to go, develop all the generate, all the information, and um, I could not do it. After three, three and a half years, I spent my hours, nights, night shifts all the time. And um, these uh, fluidized gasifiers are extremely temperamental simply because they are required to work at a very narrow temperature zone. At a temperature zone, if you, you don't have much leeway, for some reason, if you cannot control temperature, and that's why I brought it up in the previous slide, if you cannot control temperature, it will quickly go here and then pressure drops will swing, temperature will start swinging, your gas composition, online gas flow measure, composition measurements will swing like anything. So our target was, uh, uh, I mean, that's what the sponsors told us, give us 100 hour operation. Could not, could never get, and we were running a 10 bar, 300 kilograms per hour uh, rate. Maximum, I think we uh, run about 40 hours or so after that. Controlling a fluidized bed gasifier and at high pressure is a challenge. And it, it becomes even more of a challenge if your ash has a lot of iron and calcium and sodium in it. If it is only aluminosilicates, not a problem because you will have to operate it at a high temperature zone. In fact, you will, be, you will be requiring to lower its temperature, slagging temperature. So let me also make one point here. It's extremely important. Let's take, say, um, uh, fixed bed gasifier or moving bed gasifier. The particle sizes are very, very large. 50 millimeter, 100 millimeter, 3, 4 inches size. And there is a temperature gradient, as you can see, from the, uh, between the uh, uh, middle section and the upper and the other sections, etc. So because the particles are large, it is slow, a lot of lo long residence time is there. Um, therefore, the carbon conversion is not great at all. But you can control the operation well. So if you are able to sacrifice the carbon conversion, happy with stable operation, fixed bed gasifiers can operate. Huh? Here. So the ash that will eventually be generated and has to be taken out from the bottom, it will come out as dry ash, similar to the fly ash. Plus unburned carbon, exactly. And that was the point I was going to make. Um, yeah. Yes. And as, um, what's your name? I forgot. Uh, Hitesh. OK. Oh, then Hitesh, OK. So as Hitesh has said, if you prepare the char over a longer period of time, it will, unfortunately, it becomes unreactive. I mean, less reactive, sorry. So this is, if you bring it back again, at that low temperature, nothing will happen. It will simply merrily go in and merrily go out. If it is low temperature, and fixed bed gasifiers do operate at low temperature. You will never operate a fixed bed gasifier in this zone in here. Nothing. It, it, it simply signifies, <laughs> signifies that the pressure is dropping uh, wildly. Uh, these are actual, the, these are the actual the pressure drop measurements. So my pressure transducers are actually swinging like anything. Sometimes it is giving a very high pressure, uh, low pressure drop. Sometimes it is giving a high pressure drop. Uh, unpredictable behavior. Um, unpredictable, unsteady, correct. An unsteady state temperature means Forget about stable gas composition. Uh, 
50-60 percent. Jindal's uh, fixed bed gasification plant happened, what happened to those? Read it and then find it yourself, uh, in as much as it is available. Huh? Uh, JSW's um, uh, Jamnagar uh, gasification plants, fixed bed, fixed bed gasification. Based on that. that. Because, because getting the ash out of it, ash mixed with unburned carbon out of it is so much easier. So that depends on what, as I said, what is your objective? If is your objective is to get a stable operation, compromising the carbon conversion, stable operation with something, some certain quality of the gas, that's where you will go for it. But then the, the uh, penalty there is that you will be losing a lot of un unburned carbon. If you are able to put up with it, that's fine. If not, forget it. Very much so. Very much so. Because you see, if you do not take the spent material out of the gasifier at the bottom, they will simply build up and they are going to affect the heat transfer considerably, considerably. Ash is a compact thing, char is a porous thing, char requires unimpeded um, access to oxygen and heat. It will not get it if ash is there. So, you have to take the materials out on a regular basis and taking out the material on a regular basis is so much easier in engineering sense, nothing to do with chemistry if it is in this form, because its character is predictable, right. This side and I will come to that later, this side it is also very much predictable as we can see. So, if the ash has molten, literally molten and has a certain viscosity between 25 Pascal second and 150 Pascal second, then it will flow provided you, you allow it to flow in the vertical direction. Then the slag will eventually, slag will consistently come out as they are forming. They have to form because they have to protect the walls and the tubes behind the walls. So, maintaining a certain amount of slag in, inside the entrained flow gasifier is important because they protect the water tubes which uh, raise steam and control the temperature as well that way indirectly. Secondly, they have to flow because if they do not flow they will build up therefore, heat transfer will be affected and they will if they build up to such an extent that uh, you cannot the incoming coal cannot just convert anymore or the slag does not flow, then the gasifier cannot operate. So, slagging gasifiers in as much as sounds very good, have to ensure that the, slag, uh, the ash be actually becomes molten, has a certain viscosity range, so that it flows vertically and also it maintains a certain thickness. So, that takes us to another dimension then. If where will the slag, where does the slag come from? Where does the slag come from? From the 
from the minerals, from the ash. So if the coal has very little ash, then you are not forming much slag. And if the slag then flows, melts and flows faster than it is forming, then you are exposing your tubes. So the gasifier will be gone. At the same time, if you have too much ash to start with, then there will be too much slag that will be formed, then it actually can flow out, then there will be a buildup. So, what I am referring to is, there is a minimum ash content and maximum ash content that the intent flow gasifier developers specify. Minimum is, they say, if you have anything less than 6 percent, don't. Um, uh, commercially secret art. The manufacturers will not tell you. Um, the others can find it and then they can copy and um, do, do this. But yes, your answer to that is yes, that's right. At the same rate that it is forming. Building of the slag is a problem. Correct. That's also correct. That also is a problem. So, problem in what way is that your this is your uh, wall of the gasifier. Inside that, you have these water tubes. So, if there is not a protective layer because the slag is forming but is flowing fast, then these tubes will be damaged. How high? <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> How high? Of course, if you can go to Yeah. So, the, uh, in the boilers, as I mentioned yesterday, with so many decades of research, the steam temperature still has not gone past 700 degrees. Very few or less than 1 percent cases, the steam temperature ultra super uh, advanced, ultra super, super critical, only 700. So, not really much. So, if that gets exposed to say 900, day in day out, hour in hour out, it will crack, it will then be damaged, so not much really. So, the important thing is to then understand this, that again you really need to know the ash chemistry. What is there in the ash? Does it melt? If it melts, does it give you the viscosity range for it to flow? And if it flows, does it flow too fast? or too slow. So, these are all important configurations. These are known to the gasifier developers. That is why they will ask you, tell us about the coal. So, they will look at for, uh, for how much ash is there, 2 percent. Mm -mm. You will have to have other ways. There are other ways, I mean, uh, to bring up, bring the ash content up. When you do mining of coal, coal is not there from this depth of the, there to here all in one chunk. 
If you look at the mines, there are intersims. Coal, intersim of sand, clay, etc., then on the coal, and the coal, etc. So what happens to the intersim? Some companies just don't bother it, give everything. And some companies where the contract is very strictly enforced, they look at the quality of what they are getting, intersim comes in, they will be penalized. So what the potentially you can use that intersim as the uh, as a means to increase the ash content. Point I'm making is that if you go for entrained flow gasifier, you need to be aware of um, exactly what happens to your ash and at what temperature it melts, because that temperature has to be created inside the gasifier at least where the ash is melting, not necessarily in there, uh, in uh, where the carbon is converting, where ash is melting, and that's where you need to provide a lot of oxygen. So how they do it, different manufacturers do it differently, that will come in the next um, few slides. Problem happens is here. Here, because it is, it is easier to operate beyond a certain temperature, but you cannot go too high a temperature because that will drop its cold gas efficiency, right? And also for slagging gasifier, you need to put in the particles at a very fine form, but that's also lesser of an issue because you do that for PF fired boilers anyway, 10 to 100 micron. Here you need only 75 to 100 micron. So that's less of an issue. But it's the mineral content, the composition of the minerals, the quantity of the minerals, which is really important. The other thing that also happens, very, very important, ash starts to vaporize. As you would expect, if something melts, it will also vaporize. At least part of it will also vaporize. So where, where will those vapors go? What is in those vapors? They will definitely go into the cooler section of the gasifiers, right? So you need to know that as well. So the thermochemistry of this ash at high temperature is in itself is a very well established part of science. And that science-based information flows into engineering of it. So any questions for me? Not, not necessarily. I mean, this is just, uh, it can be fed co-current way. It can be fed, coal can be fed here, here, in two stages. It is a very simplistic description that we're given. And oxygen can be fed here, substoichiometric oxygen can be fed here, and wherever, if required, you can feed the temper, uh, steam, if required. But uh, don't get hung up on this drawing of the, on this schematic of the entrained flow gasifier because it really, truly, it does not reflect what happens, how an entrained flow gasifier actually looks like, even though it has come from my uh, previous employer or a subsidiary of the previous employer. But this is not how it looks like. When we go into how a GE gasifier, how a shell gasifier looks like, it will become a lot more apparent. The point is I'm trying to make is that you are, you are much better off to either operate here or op design and operate either here or design and operate either there. Higher coal conversion, yes, yes. Because of the temperature it can... Do that. What is the highest? 
Ah, okay, good. Because I said this about 6% is minimum that they specify if you press them. Anything over 10 is difficult. Then you have to look at 6 is minimum. Is, uh, then it will be too much ash for too much ash has to be slagged. Too much ash has to be molten. That is an energy consuming process. Uh, blending. So, so you, you are saying that you will blend the low ash coal with high ash coal. One way to do it, if, if that results in good carbon conversion, maybe yes. But then if you are talking about low blending of low ash coal with high ash coal, then you will have to look at what's the composition of the low ash coal and what is the composition of the ash in the high ash coal. If those are two diametrically opposite things, then you are creating another problem. But that still needs to be looked at, can be looked at, can be favorable. So one option is if you have, um, as you said before, high ash coal, can I mix it with biomass? Because biomass has a lot less ash, possibly yes. Uh, but we, we haven't seen any synergistic effect. But at least it brings the ash, ash level or ash content to a uh, manageable level, to an acceptable level. Looking at the ash chemistry is a different thing. For that, you need to do a lot more investigation. That student hasn't done, done that one. It's not part of his thesis either. That's a completely different um, um, uh, investigation. So that's what I first said in 2006 and, um, in a very sanitized way, and no one took it. And now the Japanese are going for a train for gasification. No, no, it's because in fluidized bed gasifier, uh, it's such a narrow region in which you will have to control the temperature. It's very, very difficult. And I will actually come to the, uh, the module where we discuss about that one. That will become much uh, clearer. Well, they, if uh, um, should. Uh, no, Shell, uh, we worked with Shell for the Anglo-American when I worked with them, uh, anglo Coal, the Anglo-American subsidiary. Um, there were, were problems. Eventually, that project did not go ahead, even though Shell did look at it, so dry feed gasification and trained flow. But the Japanese are doing uh, now. Shell and test flow, Japanese are also in trained flow. Almost everyone now is in trained flow. Power generation? No. See, for power generation, you need high availability. So you will therefore choose a technology which is reliable and available. If it is for chemicals production, the plant may not have to run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's a different, much smaller. There, the considerations can be different. So it all depends on the objectives. So my strictest view is, and this is precisely what I said back in 2006, is that if power generation is the focus, fluidized bed gasification for Victorian brown coal will not be, become mainstream. I put it in writing. So I'm very happy to see that, that people have now taken that on board. Say again. What is in, what is Indian coal? Yeah, I know. What is what's your definition of Indian coal? Uh -huh. 
from which part of India? Uh-huh. Yeah. So if it is high ash, um, this is not the way to go. Unless you somehow you can bring the ash down. Can be. Can you bring it down to about 10%? I don't know. I have no washery, washery experience. That's so, so, um, so someone said the, to the Jindals that in the Jamnagar plant uh, go for high ash, uh, sorry, the fixed bed gasifier, moving bed gasifier. And uh, what has happened to it, um, they know it. No, I am not updating you on that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. For a high ash coal, the blending is the way to go. Yes, if it can brought down to significantly low levels at 10, 12 percent at most, uh, if not, then uh, uh, the consideration can be given to the blending with uh, biomass, for example. Uh, but then there are uh, investigations that you really need to undertake. I mean, uh, I cannot say that because it's biomass, less ash, and etc. The ash interactions are so much important as I, we can see in here. Uh, that uh, you really no need to know that. So there is a considerable amount of R&D, and that I can say with full confidence that needs to be done in that area. It's an ex extremely gray area. The, sometimes the technology vendors I have seen, they simply get away saying wild speculative state, making wild speculative statements. It's unbelievable what happens sometimes. Anyway, let's not go into that. Yeah. 750. Dr. Davi, I'll be giving you this uh, slides. This is available. So, okay. This is, this is definitely in excess of 1200. 1200, nothing will happen below that. And I will, when I talk about the ash viscosity, Sections. So, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So inside the gasifier, what will happen to the ash is no different to what is being discussed here.
but the, un the presence of the unburned char does not affect the flowability at all. Uh, the, uh, um, you can make char of different, quanti different sizes. You can drop it slowly to a uh, small glass pipe. You will see that more or less it is flowing nicely, even at temperature. But it is the ash which gives the problem. So even if you have 30-40% unburnt char in the other 50-60-70% uh, ash, the rheology will still be, uh, if I can call it rheology, the flowability of it will still be determined by the ash itself. Because ash is so much finer as well, and char is much larger. Larger particles flow a lot better. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, and sometimes, and but that that also opens another set of um, issues. So when I say some of the coals has have very low, low um, uh, quantity of ash, two percent, three percent, and the uh, technology developers say uh, we need six percent. So where the other three, four percentage come from? So one option that we looked at because it can come out from the ash. We just mix it with ash. The problem there then is that ash is predominantly aluminosilicate and of course some calcium and a little bit iron, etc. But predominantly it is um, a different character, different density, and it is also in the slagged form uh, when it comes in that. So you have to have a system to break that slag bring that slag into a particle size, which is same particle size range as the coal that you are feeding, 75 to 100 micron. Now, you are then looking at a diff separate new processing regime or processing plant next to the gasifier. If you are prepared to do it, we haven't been able to convince uh, then it is it's fine. So the way it is going to be managed now is by bringing in the interseam material during the mining. And these are all surface mining. The loading calls are all surface mining. So you are not going into underground mining uh, with a lot more risk. Uh, loading calls are usually surface mining. Has anyone gone to Naivili? You can arrange a visit. Maybe Shantanu can check with them, take your students, give access to Naivili. Uh, it will be fascinating You will see uh, what a surface mine looks like. I think because you are involved in coal research, they might appreciate it actually, you never know. So what is there? Yeah. So, um, so so these are the three major types of the gasifiers, and they may be air or oxygen blown. Uh, steam may or may not be required. This one requires a lot of steam, lot of steam, because temperature has to be controlled around 700 degrees or so. This requires a lot less steam. This requires somewhere in between. So that's why I use the statement in here, may or may not be required. Um, and then uh, the other, but there are, apart from this, there are other unconventional gasifiers are also under development. And you, I, I will talk about a couple of them, the rocket dyne, uh, et cetera. A uh, couple more slides before you stop. And this is actually the ash character. And this is a real measurement. That's why, uh, that's what I meant. Uh, you know, in, he, in this particular ash, uh, it is done by thermomechanical analysis. Yesterday we talked about our TMA process, remember? Um, that um, you, may, you look at the ash character, the pressure drop, etc., and the percentage penetration of the piston as it is heated. And then you take the first derivative of it. This is what you will see. So is, in this region, it is very unpredictable. Here comes a temperature zone. It is somewhat predictable, 
and then here it is unpredictable and beyond that it's all hunky dory no problem another one uh, okay another one i haven't shown okay so there are lots and lots of these measurements we did about 30 or 40 of them we did previously and then that's how we form the behavior that uh, decision that look don't try to operate it in a temperature zone which will be too narrow too difficult to control and therefore i'm rul ruling out pressurized fluid ice bed completely go for um, the uh, the the other one other one other uh, important aspect is this i've completely forgot this requires starting particle size very very high large particles 100 millimeters or so but as you would expect as that coal gets paralyzed dried paralyzed then gasified it it will become smaller and smaller so there will come a stage where the bottom layers are predominantly smaller ones the upper layers are predominantly larger ones so you get a mix of that and if they get too compressed because you are not able to uh, uh, do the ash extraction effectively then you got a problem so the fish fixed beds are actually prone to clogging irrespective of what the uh, developers technology providers say and the coal itself if it is friable cannot do it hard coal you can coal is also classified as hard coal or and soft coal in addition to being classified as lignite subbituminous bituminous etc so as you go higher and higher these are all hard coal and hardness index uh, measures that so the um, i think i will stop at this point it's about 535 and um, some of you you also be have to look at the cricket what's happening in cricket um, <laughs> and uh, we give it a bit of a time and then see what happens yeah. so whether we will all come back tomorrow um, totally happy or not depends on what happens in the next three hours or so I think hopefully everything's fine okay <laughs>